attendees are joining now. Good evening. I'm Genevieve Aldani Caruso and the Acting Coordinator for Public Services at Detroit Public Library. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual event, the Detroit Public Library and American Classic. I am joined tonight by my colleague, Tanika Chapman Mills, who is assisting and monitoring the questions. We would love to hear questions from you all tonight. The Detroit Public Library is Michigan's largest public library system. People from everywhere come to the main and branch locations of the DPL to perform research, take part in our workshops, and enhance their lives through access to community resources and programming. While the Detroit Public Library has been in existence for over 155 years, the main library building in the Midtown neighborhood of Detroit was completed in 1921. And this year we are celebrating the centennial. Its architecture and design are impressive examples of a grand library that was built to inspire a city. An addition to the main structure was opened in 1963, but today's discussion will focus on the original main library building completed in 1921. We have two special guests with us here tonight to share their knowledge about the history of the DPL. Patrice Merritt and Barbara Maggi Cohn co-authored a fantastic book, The Detroit Public Library and American Classic. It was published by Wayne State University Press in 2017 and is filled with striking photographs and detailed descriptions. Both Patrice and Barbara are dear friends of the Detroit Public Library. Barbara Maggi Cohn is an art historian who focuses on research, curating, and developing unique tours for the community. She created the art and architecture tour of the DPL in 2013. Barbara is on the board of directors of the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation, vice president of the Jewish Historical Society of Michigan, and an active docent at the Detroit Institute of Arts. She is currently finishing a master's in museum studies at Johns Hopkins University. Patrice Merritt received her master's degree in library science from Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts. And she served as a librarian and library fundraiser for over 30 years. She was the executive director of the Detroit Public Library Friends Foundation for almost 15 years. She now resides in Rancho Mirage, California. And besides writing books and embarking on speaking engagements, she is the chairman of the board for the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation. Please welcome both Patrice Merritt and Barbara Cohn to Detroit Public Library's virtual stage. Thank you, Jenny, and hello, Detroit. Thank you for asking Barbara and me to join in the celebration of Cass Gilbert's beautiful edifice on Woodward Avenue. I am Patrice Merritt, zooming to you from Rancho Mirage, California, and honored that you invited me to join you this evening. Both Barbara and I would like to thank the DPL for its kind invitation with special thanks to our host, Jenny Caruso and her team for taking the time to perfect our appearance and to ensure that te technology is working, fingers crossed. Um, as Jenny said, this is the 100th anniversary of the building and, and our tour this evening will only cover the original main library building and not the addition. This is our opportunity to pay homage to Cass Gilbert and his army of designers and craftsmen who contributed to this architectural marvel. Barbara, next slide. In 2013, Patrice and I started an art and architectural tour of the library. We call these two pictures our Alfred Hitchcock moment where we put ourselves in the book. In the top photo is Patrice in the yellow dress giving a tour to a group of ladies and I'm on the lower photo, giving a tour to a Cub Scout troop. We had our first public tour in December, 2013, and 75 people showed up. We had no idea if anyone would be there. We were thrilled with the numbers. And after the tour, people thanked us, they clapped, and they cried. They shared stories about what the library meant to them. One question kept coming up over and over again. Do you have a book on this beautiful building? Well, Patrice and I laughed first, then we made a pinky promise. And in 2015, we started writing the book. And as Jenny said, the, our publishers was Wayne State University Press 
and the book was released in 2017. Our idea was a community book. No one was paid that worked on the book. All proceeds go to the library. We had 18 different photographers and that ranged from age 18 to 70. And there are over 200 photos in the book, both historic and contemporary. So remember, if you purchase a book, a portion goes back to the library and you can feel good about it. Stunning in its elegance, here is the Detroit Public Library upon completion in 1921. Two women are on the portico, which I always admire because it sort of says something of the times. One is extremely well-dressed and the other one seems to be her handmaiden holding a satchel. I'd like to think that these two women are on their daily routine of errands in and about Detroit and one of the most popular places to, for them to visit or special places for them to visit was the library. But as you look at the architecture, the building is white marble. You see ionic arches, symmetry, a large portico. And as you will see through the presentations, you will see elements of mythology, ornamentation and other iconography, both inside and out. We will come back to this picture a couple of times during the presentation to sort of put you in a location so that you can better understand the art and architecture that we are referencing. Next slide. The Detroit Public Library is a Carnegie Library. Andrew Carnegie donated $375,000 for the building of this library. He donated money to build over 2,500 libraries throughout the world. There are 61 Carnegie libraries in Michigan. And besides this one, there are 60 other um, Carnegie branch libraries, Bowen, Butzel, Connolly, Duffield, Ginsburg, and Lothrop. Carnegie had a formula for giving money to libraries. You had to demonstrate the need for a library. You must be able to financially maintain the library. The money could not be used for the building site or land. And most importantly, it had to provide free service to all. So once Carnegie gave the initial um, money, Cass Gilbert was chosen to be the architect. He was chosen from over 20 firms, both locally and nationally. Gilbert studied at MIT. He worked for McKim, Mead and White. And he went on a grand tour of, Italy, of Europe, sketching architectural features that he would eventually use in his designs. He was a well-known American architect, an early proponent of skyscrapers. Here you can see the Woolworth building, the 60 story building that he designed, which opened in 1913 in New York City. He also um, designed other works of um, buildings throughout the country, such as Oberlin College, the US Supreme Court, St. Louis Library and Art Museum, and many municipal buildings in Minnesota. Gilbert had a philosophy about libraries. It's not just a place to get a book, but a symbol of cultural life in the community. The library cost $2.7 million at the time, which is equivalent to about 37 million today. Interesting fact about Cass Gilbert, he was named for his prominent great uncle, Lewis Cass. And no, as I always like to say, Cass Gilbert is not related to Dan Gilbert. That was one of the biggest jokes actually and most popular question on our tour. He also designed the James Scott Memorial Fountain in Belle Isle Park, which was completed in 1925. It's 500 feet wide and the central fountain sprays water as high as 125 feet into the air. There are 109 water outlets in the shape of dolphins and turtles and lions as you see and human figures. Well, here we are, Detroit, March 1915, a muddy Detroit in March. And this is the excavation of the library beginning. Technology, Industrial Revolution, has provided the use of steam for bulldozing, but alas, the horse and carriage remain transportation mode for hauling away materials. The steam shovel reads M.E. Ryan and Sons, Detroit, Michigan. The builder at this time was a firm called Irwin and Lighton. Um, the firm, believe it or not, is still operating in, out of, in, in business in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. But what we like about this, this image is that you start to see a background of a city center somewhere, but boy, things are still pretty messy and premature in the um, cultural center of Detroit. We are looking south in this image. Next slide, Barbara. Construction began in 1915, but stopped due to World War I. There was just an inability to obtain material, construction materials because everything was going toward the war effort. 
Building resumed in 1917, hence the cornerstone was laid. Again, as Barbara said, the building was not completed until 1921. So you're getting a sense of this was a long process from the, from the time Mr. Carnegie gave the money to Detroit. Um, cornerstones are fascinating to me. This one is positioned at the northeast corner of the library at Woodward and Kirby. And, and it seems like a, a thing of the past. We no longer see cornerstones necessarily installed on new buildings. And so this, this was just a photo. A photographer saw this and thought it sort of captured time in and of its place. Next slide. And now you see the structure coming out of the ground. Um, again, you're looking south and west. It is a steel edifice, regardless of, of what it may have built. The white stone marble had to adhere to something sturdy. But here you are in a field of debris with weeds and and trees and just junk shown, thrown everywhere. You would think you're in the middle of the hinterland. And quite frankly, the north end of Woodward Avenue at that point in time was far from the city center. Um, at this point, the building, the, the, the builder has been switched and is now a George A. Fuller of Detroit. The reason that the builders had to switch was because due to the war effort, construction materials became very, very expensive when construction resumed. So the Common Council had to re resubmit all the purchase arrangements, and it turned out that, that George Fuller became a cheaper builder, despite the fact that the previous builder was still at work. Next slide, Barbara. And here we go again, the view of the framework. We are now in May in 1918. Um, the front of the library is in place, and, and Barbara, can you show where the lintel is for the main door? Right there. You're starting to see the cornice work along the front. And then the cornerstone will be laid in the lower right corner. And across that beautiful front is where the portico is yet to, to be developed. Um, you have to understand that the elevator had been invented in 1852. So these massive hoists on the side were not new. They were able to get materials to higher levels as well as um, workmen to the sites. It's pretty fascinating. There were multiple thick pictures showing this progression and we could only fit in a very, very few for the book. And then alas, the final phase. This is the, this is a favorite picture of Barbara and I because it was taken in 1921 from quite some height. Aerial photography was not necessarily popular. You are looking at the rear of the building from Cass Avenue. Across this front where Woodward Avenue would be, you would see that the DIA is not even built yet. So when people ask where the public library is, they always say it's across the street from the DIA, which is wrong because the library is not across the street from the DIA. The DIA is across the street from the library. Um, this area was being defined as a cultural center even then. This isn't anything new um, because the university was soon to erupt. You can see we're in a very, very residential section. You can see where the Detroit Historical Museum will ultimately be on the corner of Woodward and Kirby and the aforementioned DIA. And yet this is a neighborhood in transition. At the upper right, you see a factory appearance, long rectangular building, which is no longer there. We, we aren't sure what it is. So again, this is just an area that is coming alive and designed to do so. Next slide. The marble doorway and the bronze entrance doors to the Detroit Public Library. Note the statement above the lintel, knowledge is power. The doors were designed by John Donnelly and are representative of the doors from Donatello Sacristy at the Church of San Lorenzo in Florence, Italy. The panes, the eight panes, I'm sorry, the 10 panes depict the phases of Greek and Roman literature, epic, tragic, lyric, philosophic, and comic. comic. Each panel depicts a teacher with their student and the left panels depict Grecian teachers, the right Roman. We also like to point out on this the repeated um, iconography that you will see. There are rosettes surrounding the door. You will see acanthus leaves everywhere throughout the building, usually framing um, an architectural marble. And of course, the eagles are at the top. And I don't want to be repetitive, but again, you will see these throughout the building very much in the classical design, very much what Cass Gilbert saw as he did his European tour as a, as a young man trying to study the classic classic, classic designs that permeated um, Western culture. Next slide, Barbara. And here you have Aristotle with a young Alexander, done in bronze, bas relief, 
the detail is absolutely incredible. If you look to the left of Aristotle's hand, you will see a scroll unfurling to the ground. You will see their sandals and the laces upon their sandals. The lower right, there's a fence. And then you will also see the outline of mountains. And in the very center, there's the mountain with a building on top. And because this is Greek, we assume that is the Acropolis. And then the ever-present acanthus leaves framing this beautiful bronze piece. Cass Gilbert designed the library in Italian Renaissance style, looking back to classic Greek and Roman design and symbolism. As I said before, he went to Italy and incorporated many of the architectural features into his works. Frederick Wiley was the designer for the library interiors. Wiley was from Detroit. He went to Harvard Law School and then opened a design studio called Paris and Wiley out of New York. The entrance hall here you're looking at is 25 feet high and the walls and colonnade of Doric columns are pink Tennessee marble. On the right is a ceiling detail and you can see the colors of this old kind of antique gold and grays and blues. And there's a rosette in the center surrounded by classic ornamentation, that Greek key that you will see all over the library, the egg and dart and the bead and reel, all to create a feeling of old world elegance. This is the original children's library room. It's a historic photo. Now this room is a teen center, but you must be 13 years old to enter. But in 1921, there were no teen centers. All the children, regardless of your age, were together. This photo was typical of the time that is not staged. Every child has a book in their hand, an open book, and they're all reading. In the background, you can see the paneling, which was quartered oak, meaning no knots, the bookshelves, and you can see original furniture and the lights and the floor. Um, in the background, you can also see the Poabic fireplace, which at one time was a working fireplace. The most popular program at the library for many years was story time, where the librarian would sit in front of the fireplace and read a story and people would remember and tell us on the tour that they remember coming there. The fireplace was designed by Mary Chase Perry Stratton and Horace, and Horace James Culkins from Powat Pottery of Detroit 1903 when they started it. It was one of the first things completed in the library in 1919. There are 10 different ceramic tiles um, depicting fairy tales. Some of them are Ulysses, Tin Soldier, Alice in Wonderland, Aladdin, um, let's see, Robinson Crusoe. And above is a frieze of Aesop's fable, the owl and the birds, and owls right in the center representing wisdom. The fireplace is still one of the highlights of the library. And actually the cost of it at the time was $525. Here's a close up of Hansel and Gretel, and you can see the remnants of the signature Poabic iridescent glaze and this figure eight around here, which they were known for. And you can see the blues and the green and remember, this tile is 102 years old. Over the fireplace was this map of Michigan. It was installed two years after the library opened, and it was a mural painted by Frederick Wiley. There are very few words on the map because Wiley felt children learned visually. He said, when children are taught by this image, geography becomes a joy. On the left side is the wilderness of Michigan, and you can see the Native Americans, the forest, the screech owl, and the rabbits romping through the forest. And then the right side of the French when they came in the early 1700s and brought with them memories from France they left behind, such as the formal gardens and the swans and fountains. One of the first thing the French did when they arrived was establish St. Anne's Church, you see right here. And below is, are the mottos of Michigan, and I will translate the state motto of Michigan if you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. So we've left the main entrance and we encounter uh, um, travel to the third floor via the double grand staircase where the visitor is struck by art from all directions. Murals on the walls, painted ceilings, marble balustrades, mammoth globe-like lighting. Note as you come up the stairs, the two puti or cherubs as you embark up the steps. In the middle, they hold a wreath and you will see books and a lantern. The books, again, symbolizing learning, 
the lantern symbolizing enlightenment. This is massive and our, um, capturing it to heads. Our photographers did a wonderful job trying to, to capture the massive nature of this building as you come up these stairs. Next slide, Barbara. As we had come up the stairs, we always would advise people not to look up because there was art in so many directions. It was, e it was easy to trip. The ceiling alone is mesmerizing in its detail. At the far end, not pictured here, are two quotes in rectangular panels, and they're embedded into the ceiling design. Again, the same replica ornamentation that Barbara referenced, the Greek key design, the acanthus leaves um, where the chandeliers are. And then you see two squares on each side of the, of the arts and le letters and art sign. And Cass Gilbert and Frederick Wiley always wanted to reference something that was local, incorporated something of the history and that would appeal to the common man when they came to this building. And they, then they did so in the four seals. Barbara, the next slide. Here they are. Each one of these is embedded in the ceiling. The University of Michigan, which was founded in Detroit in 1817, the Great Seal of the United States, the Seal of the State of Michigan, and the Seal of the City of Detroit. Again, everything is, is further framed in architectural detail. Here we see bead and wheel design, Greek key, and the ever-present acanthus leaves. So as you can imagine, as we were standing on the, on the level looking up, your eyes were just had so many things to look at at one point in time that we simply could not gather everything for tonight's um, appearance. But we hope that when you go to the library, you just really take a look and just marvel at the ceiling that Wiley designed. Next slide. As Patrice said, as you walked up the grand staircase, you were surrounded by beautiful murals. They were painted by Edwin Blashfield and Vincent Adorante. The theory was, as you walked up, you would be inspired with the murals about the arts. The other murals were music, graphic arts, and prose. And this mural is called the Poets or Poetry. There are 37 people depicted here. And I'll point out a couple for you. Here we have Milton and Shakespeare, Chaucer, Homer, a muse. There's always, there's lots of muses all over the library for inspiration. We have Pindar, the ancient Greek poet, and we have, um, Virgil and Dante holding, holding a book. We even put in the book a legend to let you know who everyone is. Um, we love this because you see who's standing next to each other and who were considered poets at the time. Note please Mozart and Beethoven, they were all poets. So again, an inspiration as you walked up to the third floor. So as we came up to the, up to the stairs, um, you could either go left or you could go right. And in this particular case, let's imagine we went left where you were presented with the, well, the Yellen Gate, which welcomes visitors to the fine arts room. Designed by Samuel Yellen, this iron gate is adorned with a quatrefoil design and contains numerous iconographies. The side panels depict signs of the zodiac, but atop you will see sunflowers, and as the insert shows, a lantern with a book, again, knowledge and enlightenment, and in the upper left corner are two clipper ships. And I like to reference this from Emily Dickinson's poem. There is no frigate like a book to take us miles away. Whether or not that was the inspiration, that is our interpretation. Um, there's also a sort of sentimental story with this gate. Every night upon closing, the Yellen Gate is closed. And the next morning upon opening, the Yellen Gate and its lock, which is still operational, welcomes visitors to the fine arts room. Yellen did a lot of work in Detroit. He did a choir loft and an alms box at Blessed Sacrament Cathedral. There's Yellen work at the DIA, the Cranbrook Gate, and in some of the Boston Edison homes, you will also see Yellen's work um, on display. And next, Barbara. And here again is the Yellen Gate. Um, the detail, the quatrefoil design is, is clearly seen here. And as I referenced the, the um, Zodiac, here you have Gemini, the twins. This beautiful corridor is the gateway to the various fine arts rooms on this floor. While we have very few before and after photos in this book, um, this one really was important because the modern day view was easily recreated by our talented photographers. The chandeliers are still in use and are as vibrant today as they were then. Note that there are seven vaulted ceilings that extend throughout the corridor. Again, you see the ionic columns, and the grandeur of this building just 
and overwhelms the visitor as you look up at every single ceiling. Next, Barbara. And here is a detail of one of the vaulted ceilings. Again, we'll repeat the architectural elements, but here you see women of the arts. One is a sculptor, one is a reader, and one is a painter. And these colors are in rich teals and greens and blues and reds, and they are striking. As Barbara said, over 100 years old, and they are still quite striking. Along this corridor um, are Aesop's fables. Aesop was a Greek fabulist and storyteller, and he's credited with numerous stories collectively known as Aesop's fables. Barbara referenced him um, in the Puabic fireplace in the children's room. Tales from across the centuries are credited to him in a storytelling tradition that continues to this day. Um, most of his tales are characterized by animals that solve problems and have human characteristics. A fable is depicted in each one of the seven vaults along the corridor. Here you have the story of the fox and the, and the stork. The fox was wanted to amuse himself by inviting the stork to dinner. And the fox cleverly served soup in a bowl, which only the fox could enjoy. However, the stork, on the next slide, please, reciprocated and invited the fox to dinner and served wonderful fish in large tubes which only the stork could enjoy. So what is the mor moral of the, of the fable? Do not play tricks on your neighbors unless you can stand the same treatment yourself. The fox and the stork. Love that. <laughs> this, uh, we often get asked the question, what is our favorite picture or image or item in the library? And this happens to be mine. Um, these three, male, these three figures are depicted in the mural above the entrance to the delivery room. It is entitled, The Joining of the Waves. On the left, you have an individual with a cape designed with an anchor. And you will see a rope extending out of her hand um, in, to the, attached to the bow of a boat in the water. You also see the detail in that the rope extends over her right hand. And I say her because we, we have read that these are all female figures. So you have the waterway individual on the left. To the right is an individual and you'll see looking very industrial. There's a wheel on the cape, hand on the wheel. The imagery represents the Great Lake waterways and the economic impact of shipping as a major form of transportation. So this is the joining of the ways, the joining of the power of both water transportation into industry. Again, Cass Gilbert and Frederick Wiley capturing local culture. The female figure in the center represents the spirit of Detroit. She is youthful and, and, and in her vitality. Her wings are splayed, which again, opening up, celebratory. She is adorned with a flag bearing cape and you can see further flag embellishments at the drapery in the lower right-hand corner. In her lap, she holds the seal of the city of Detroit, which was also featured in the barrel vaulted ceiling. The tiles that surround her, her halo are not tiles at all. Barbara and I originally thought that these were gold leaf intricately placed within. No, each square is painted to depict a tile-like image. It is absolutely stunning when you see it and it, it is a, a wonderful entrance. But again, understanding what it is and what it says really is powerful. This is the great delivery hall. It's a large stately room measuring 75 by 75 square feet. The ceiling is 36 inch, uh, feet tall. The walls are limestone. It is palatial in proportions. This photo was from 1921 when the building opened and two years later these clear windows were replaced with beautiful painted windows. The chandeliers were done by Sterling Company and they are beautiful. There's tiny little tulips all around. Actually, this is a wonderful view of them. You can see them. So the design of the ceiling was replic replicated from a small nave from St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The pattern of coffers and rosettes of large dimensions are in deep relief. In the center of each coffer is a large gold rosette and the construction beams form octagons and the colors are pale green, blue, and light gray. 
This photo is from 2014 looking south. And here are the three painted windows that were designed by Frederick Wiley. And Frederick Wiley designed all the windows in that room. The design is Italian Renaissance in character. And it looks like the title page from an illuminated manuscript. Throughout the windows are mythology, Latin, muses, angels, symbolism, quotes, and creatures. And under the cornice is a quote from Cass Gilbert. Books are the most enduring monuments of man's achievements. Through them, civilization becomes cumulative. The next slide we look at will be actually a close-up of the center beautiful window. Ah, there it is. So the windows were actually designed for a purpose, the emission of white light from a light bulb that was behind them. During the day, the light would come through to illuminate the room. The colors are light silver with a little touch of bright colors. These are painted glass windows, not stained glass, and the process is very different. In the center, you can see an angel here with outstretched wings, and the Latin word spiro to breathe in, and another angel here with wings. And, the, and around you can see an architectural border framed with peacocks and griffins and sphinx and floral arabesques. And on the bottom of the central panel right here, we can see a quote from the Canadian scientist George Mercer Dawson. He said this quote in a speech in 1866 at the dedication of the Birmingham England Free Library. The great consulting room of a wise man is a library. So Gary Melcher did a series of murals documenting the early history of Detroit. Melcher was born in Detroit and he studied in Paris. His father was sculptor Julia, Julius Melcher, which did uh, several sculptures all around Detroit. To the left, this mural is called The Landing of Cadillac's Wife, 1703, and it represents Detroit in its earliest days when Cadillac and about 100 of his men came to the Detroit River. And by the way, the arrival of these French women represents Detroit's metamorphosis from a military post to a city. And in the middle, you have the spirit of the, of the Northwest, where St. Clair is in the middle, and she's holding her symbols of purity, a white lily in the holy book. And there are two men below her. On the left is the mature older man, an experienced trapper, and to the right is the young explorer looking for unknown waterways. The mural to the right is called The Conspiracy of Pontiac, which was a very well-known rebellion in 1763 between the American Indians and the British rule. This is one of the few photos that captures library visitors and its patrons at work. People reading, researching, staff at desks, people requesting materials. Um, we even see a small child at the, at the service desk. This is the delivery room. And again, we did not have open stacks at this time. Materials had to be requested at a service desk. And then they were they were delivered to the patron um, in the in the in obviously in the delivery room. If you look at the desk, Barbara can point out these sort of rounded objects. These are pneumatic tubes. And for those of you that are old enough to remember department stores, when you would put your money in a tube and it would be sent off to the accounting magically and come back with your change, that is how materials or slips of paper were delivered to this closed stack area in order for pages to retrieve the materials and hence deliver them to the delivery room. Um, Cass Gilbert designed seven tiers of stack areas on the cast side of the library. They were unavailable to the public. Within these, these stack areas, Barbara, could you please go to the next slide? Um, you would see stairwells. And so pick the, this, these young people, either on roller skates or walking. Um, picture on the left is from the 20s, picture on the right is from the 60s, would literally retrieve materials, having received a pneumatic tube, and then would either personally walk it to the delivery room or use an electronic book lifter to send it up to the appropriate floor. Um, interestingly, the floors in this area, again, form and function are white glass. There are very small windows in this area and Cass Gilbert wanted the light to be able to reflect and be effective in helping people see throughout this area. Materials for the floors had to be well suited to the function, namely the ability for natural light to penetrate the remote areas. We really love telling the story about delivery because we're so used to just walking into public libraries and, and browsing. Browsing was not necessarily the way libraries operated at that time. 
hence the name for this magnificent room known as the delivery room. Here's another uh, photograph that, again, the before and after. This is the civics room under construction from January 1920. And here is the room finished. Note the herringbone oak floor and the wood built-ins of quartered oak again, and the pocket doors, which we'll look at in a moment, and the original furniture. So when the library opened, these walls were painted yellow. The ceiling is the most extravagant ceiling in the building, and it was copied from one of the ceilings from Doge's Palace in Venice. The colors are blue, gold, and light gray. And a frieze around the room, you'll see a series of triangular pendentives and these lunettes, these half moons with um, people's faces and profiles in circles. There are rosettes and acanthus leaves. Let's take a little close up. We'll show you a special detail. Ooh, excuse me. Ah, there. This is the corner of the room. You can see all the gold I was talking about in the different colors. We love this photo, Patrice and I, because even the angels are holding <laughs> books. And a book represents knowledge, a closed book, an open book represents access to knowledge. And here you can see these angels and these colorful wings, and you can see some of the details I talked about. I know I mentioned pocket doors, but really we wanted to show you these. These are double pocket doors of solid oak, solid wood. They were used in the third floor around certain rooms for sound insulation. There are special brass door plates were created. And on the cartouche, you see three letters, DCL, Detroit City Library. And you can even see the, this torch right here, which is, which is lit, which represents enlightenment. So now we're gonna go back to this wonderful photo um, to show you an area, which I love to say, one of the great secrets of the Detroit Public Library is the loggia. And it's this area right here. A loggia actually means one side open to the outside. And it was commonly used in architecture during the Renaissance. It expresses grace and harmony. And we're gonna be looking at the ceiling up here. So Frederick Wiley designed the ceiling and it was executed by Powabek. It is made, it is a mosaic made of tiny little baked clay tiles. They're not glass. Wiley chose for the subject of the ceiling from William Shakespeare's As You Like It, The Seven Ages of Man. Each arch is a different phase of man's life. It is one of Shakespeare's most frequently quoted passages. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and they have their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. So the arches are infancy, boyhood, lover, soldier, justice, old age, and decrepitude. So here is the first arch in its infancy. Each arch um, has a different quote, Latin on it, different symbolisms, and is a different color. And this is beautiful blue. And, and by the way, this was done in, in um, 1919 also. Um, the library opened in 1921, so it's 102 years old also. It was done very early in the process. Here we see infancy in the middle, and we see storks, which represents babies, and an open book. Um, meaning knowledge. And we want to point out, Patrice and I just talked about this before we went on tonight, um, how this rectangle has Cass Gilbert's name and the date and was one, not uncommon for architects to sign the building. So. And here is um, the fourth arch, which is soldier. You can see the, again, a different color, the rusts and the yellows and a little bit of this light green. It says jealous and honor, sudden and quick and quarrel. So interesting about this is um, this area is closed to the public. It, it's quite problematic. You have to take a step up and down and no one really goes out there anymore. But we were lucky enough to go out a couple times at night for a couple tours. And the first time we went out um, on the, uh, the floor are all these giant floodlights. When you turn them on, the ceiling is illuminated and the Pawabic tile sparkle. So the first time we were out there, I cried. And as Patrice and I were rehearsing this, Patrice cried. So I don't know if she's <laughs> crying now. <laughs> and here we are again, back to our beautiful classical design. Um, as Barbara pointed out, the loggia has the seven arches. And if you recall, the vaults, vaulted 
corridor also has the seven arches. So the symmetry was both internal and external to this building. But we wanted to show you the highest points of this building. Cass Gilbert selected white marble because he wanted it to glisten in the sunlight. So the eye would be captured upward. It is very easy for us to just show you the interiors, but these, these, this height is extremely, extremely difficult to capture, even as to the naked eye from the outside of the building. First, you will see a mammoth frieze across the highest point of this facade depicting signs of the zodiac. So, and, that, and they're, they're huge. Here they are um, done in marble. One of our photographers was kind enough to do them individually for us. And I cannot tell you the detail is, it's just like the bronze doors, the detail is absolutely magnificent. Um, the Pisces, the fish are on the lower right. And if you were close, you would actually be able to see their teeth. That is how careful the sculpting was. Um, the scorpion, which is sort of center in the bottom, um, tentacles and eerily captured um, through the stone. But again, if you look across to the top of the building, Barbara, could you just go back one slide, please? You can see how they would be aligned magnificently across the top, very difficult to capture. Above the frieze is a cornice executed by the Atlantic Terracotta Company, colored in an old ivory tone and backed with gold. Gilbert wanted the sun, as I said, to radiate off the white marble, but also wanted the facade to reflect the sun at the top of the building. Hence, that's why that sort of gold and ivory tones. Again, hard to capture, and we can only credit our photographers for the patience and endurance that they did to provide these photos for our book. And here we close with the 1950, the Detroit Public Library at night from the portico of the DIA. By in 1926, library director Adam Strom was already saying that, quote, congestion was serious, unquote, and that attendants were on the verge of the breaking point and that the building had already outgrown its ability to provide quality service a mere five years after opening. However, it was not until 1955 that funds were appropriated for a new edition. This is the last photograph that Patrice and I put in the book. And we were thinking about a card catalog. Should we put it in or should we not? And we did, and we love it. On the tours, or even when people are at the library, people always ask, do you still have card catalogs? So we say, yes, we still have card catalogs. They're in the Burton. So thank you for joining us tonight. This was actually fun for us to, to <laughs> sit together, especially from California and from um, West Bloomfield. So thank you. And I think Jenny's going to handle the questions for us. <laughs> that, was, that was a fascinating, fascinating presentation. And the photographs are absolutely stunning. Uh, before we get started with questions, I want to let our audience know that this lovely book, you're seeing the cover of it on the, on the screen right now. This lovely book is available at local bookstores, including Source Booksellers on Cass, Pages Bookshop on Grand River, and the Detroit Institute of Arts. Of course, it's also available through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Wayne State University bookstores. Um, so we do have a few questions for you. And um, one is, um, why, why did they place the library at its current location? Barbara, do you wanna go? Sure. So interesting that the, the city hired um, architects and city planners to come in. They hired Edwin Bennett from Chicago, architect and uh, Frank Miles Day out of Philadelphia. And they actually came in and they submitted a plan in 1913 to talk about the Center of Arts and Letters. So this was really a plan that was designed for, for the city. They took a look at the area, they actually made suggestions such as landscape, such as the other building shouldn't be taller. So this was actually a planned area that they came in and other architects came in and took a look at. Uh, it kind of ties in with another question that, that we got into the um, Q&A and that is uh, what were the demographics of the people in the residential area where the cultural center emerged. Do you, do you know that? Or was this all just sort of undeveloped land here at this point? I, I suspect from the image for the, the aerial photography that we had that it was very um, <clears throat> residential. 
And from what we've learned, even at Wayne State University, the houses that were demolished and a lot of the, um, the malls throughout the campus were original streets of the city of Detroit that contained lots of housing. So it'd be safe to say that at least on that side of the building, it was very, very residential. But we, ne we never really did a, um, a demographic study to see what the components were. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, what else have we got? Um, uh, Patrice, you mentioned that your favorite piece uh, in, in out of the artwork was the joining of the ways, right. um, which was amazing. Um, Barb, do you have a favorite? Well, after Patrice talked about that, it's probably become my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that one. It, it's it's hard for me to pick Please. a favorite. I, I do love um, the Poabic fireplace. It, to me, it's um, it's really beautiful. And I'd like to really, when I was there, I would picture actually it being lit and a, and a librarian sitting with children around it. So it's hard, it's hard. There's so many it's beautiful hard. elements. It's hard. It is hard. Yeah. Why pink Tennessee marble? Is there a reason behind that? Or was it just like really like great marble? <laughs> I, think, I think it sort of goes to, to Cass Gilbert's um, Americanization. Um, I think the whole local thing, telling the local story, wanting to use American materials in incorporating classic design. That's kind of how we came up with the title, the Detroit Public Library, an American classic. That while there is wonderful you know, European architecture, there are things about it that make it distinctly American. And I think that Pete Tennessee Marble is one of those things, that he really wanted to incorporate American material. You know, it kind of leads to another question, and that is that a, a library um, is functional. It, it's, uh, it's a place for information, it's a workplace, it's, uh, people use it for leisure activities and, and things like that, but it's always been a very functional place to be. And yet you have these, these just amazing uh, grand staircases. Um, do you have any, any remarks or did you, do you have any insight into why, why such grandeur in such a functional utilitarian setting? I think it was typical of the time. If you look at other magnificent libraries, the Philadelphia Free Library, the Chicago, New York Public Library, people that had wealth at that time were very philanthropic and realized America was changing. America was inviting a major immigrant population. Education was being dealt at a, at a lower level. And I think this was sort of a benevolent factor. The people of wealth felt that they made these wonderful buildings that it would invite even the common man to come in. You know, to this day, the public library remains the most democratic of institutions. We don't ask who you are, what's in your wallet. You just come in our doors and use us. And I think creating these wonderful temples was just some, some way of saying we share this great wealth and we want to share this wealth and this knowledge with all, all kinds of people. And I think even in modern architecture today, you still see some of that in libraries, still have these grand spaces that are some, somewhat of a, a bright spot that sort of makes the place come together, a synergy for the center. Um, I also think that Remember, we're talking about the 1920s. Everybody went to the library. I mean, so it really was quite a symbol to go there and see this really beautiful building. And as Cass Spielberg always would say, you know, public buildings should be beautiful. So he really wanted it to be grand. And uh, again, having the money from Carnegie helped. So I think I agree with everything Patrice said. That's what was going on at the time, building these grand libraries. They were symbols. There's also so much um, everywhere you look on the third floor there, th there's, there's an intricate design in every corner, yeah. um, just an inch away from another, another piece. There's something different and, and there's something different everywhere you look. Um, so we, you could go piece by piece and say, what does an owl mean? What does this mean? There are open books, there are closed books. Is, is there something significant open versus closed? I think Barbara addressed that. Barbara, oh, did you? Oh, okay. yeah. So a, a book, a closed book is not, a book is knowledge and open right. book is access to knowledge. Okay. Right. So I, also, also knowledge yet to be acquired, a closed book. Is oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's I would right. say that we always would say there's something special in every room. In every room you go, there's something to see, either a different ceiling, a statue, something there. 
when you, you were doing how many you can't tell us how many photographs we looked at from every niche in every corner oh we have to have that serpent why uh -huh. <laughs> you remark that this is crazy you remark that um the photographers um how 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 long a process was it to to acquire the uh you talked about the photographers that would come in and you were working with photographers maybe some amateurs that came in and all that how uh, how long a process was that? Was it? It must have been very difficult to select the final photographs that went into this book. It was very difficult. We uh, yeah, we looked at thousands probably of photographs. It was and some of them we didn't even know who did them. You know, we really wanted to be objective, and we um, and people would submit them, and we would look for historic photographs. It did. I think the book took about a year and a half writing, but right. Teresa and I were diligent. We met once a week or twice a week, and then we gave each other homework. And came back so we uh, took about a year and a half to do the book and, and the photographers were sometimes just people who came on the tour and suddenly took a great photograph and sent it to us um in other cases we had uh, two gentlemen that taught photography and they brought their class to the library as sort of a teaching episode and we saw them and we're like wow you're taking all these photographs what do you want to do with them so it gave many of these amateur photographers an opportunity to be published and at the back of the book, we do a thumbnail sketch of each and every one of the photographers with a little little blurb about who they are and their contributions. They weren't paid. You know, they donated their their expertise, their time and their photography. We couldn't have done, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, now, what um, when you would do the tours, what were some of the comments that you would hear? Um, normally like what 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 did people say as they went through i i think the oohs and the ahs were gone pretty quickly but there was always this sense of one i've never been in this building oh i've driven by this building thousands of times i never knew this was here i can't believe i haven't been here was a good portion of the, the sentiment and then when they came into the building it was always i need to come back and bring my mother or my mother told me she came and i'm going to bring her back for a tour I think, as I said earlier, it's just so overwhelming in, in terms of its scope. Um, everyone had been to the DIA, but no one had ventured across the street to come into the library. So we saw a real um, uptick in people after the tours, just sort of roaming through the library, looking at the beautiful art, which we also at some point embarked upon a labeling project. So we, we highlighted a few things and told the story of a few of the bigger images in the building. Barbara, do you um, have any great stories about- I was gonna say really pretty much the same thing where people would come in and say, I've never been here before and say, I can't believe this, this is here and I've never seen it. And that was actually what happened to me in 2013. I'd never been in the building. So, you know, coming in and exploring and looking around, but also I loved when people would share stories, um, what the library meant to them. You know, we'd get lots of stories. I used to study here. I remember my my father and mother taking me here. So it was really, really nice to hear stories about the library, what it meant to different people. Um, someone in the questions has asked, um, uh, what are other com comparable libraries to uh, to this, um, you know, that, that, are, that are similar in terms of the grandeur and that kind of thing? Do well, the St. Louis Public Library that is mentioned is almost a twin. If you go yeah. into the delivery room there, it's an actual twin to our library. The Free Library of Philadelphia, certainly the New York Public Library, the Chicago Public Library. With a more modern spin, I would say the San Francisco, I'm um, the LA Public Library. I say similar, more modern, but again, local history, local artists, more of a California style, but sort of replicating that sense of grandeur in a different generation. Um, it, it was a time when libraries were just being built out of phil philanthropic desire and to, to to show that the city was grand. You know, I think in many ways, this sort of puts a mark on a city to have a grand building like this. I mean, who doesn't go visit the New York Public Library? I mean, everybody talks about, you know, feed the lions at the Detroit Public Library. Detroit has, this is equal, equal. And, and the next time you look at the Supreme Court building on a newscast, look at it. That's Cass Gilbert. That's Cass Gilbert who did your Detroit Public Library. And that speaks volumes to me. Um, someone else has asked, um, and perhaps you mentioned it generally, um, how did you become interested in the Detroit Public Library and, um, you know, how did you come together? You know, uh, you talked about how you came up with the concept of the book, but did, is this where you met? Was it the Detroit yes. Public Library? Yes. 
Barbara, you tell the story. <laughs> you tell it better, Patrice. <laughs> A oh, strange anyway. woman walked into my office one day and said. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was, um, I walked into the library and I was trying to talk to somebody about it. And I was trying to, I was figuring out how I, if I was interested, maybe other people interested. And I thought about it, I'd like to get more information or, so actually I was a little frustrated. I was trying to figure out who to talk to. And believe it or not, my father-in-law said, you've got to call Patrice Merritt from the Friends Foundation. <laughs> That's the person. I'm like, how would you know? But okay. And he was right. So I called her and then we got together. I came over really her office. Yeah. And she, she was sort of anxious about, well, I'm thinking about like doing this tour and do you think we could do it? And I just said, sure. I know. She was like, sure. <laughs> so here we are. The next 10 months, we, uh, we went to work on creating this tour. So researching and everything. So what are you working on now, both of you? What, what Do you have um, projects in the works right now? I'm working on with a local artist, artist author here. Um, Rancho Mirage is a relatively new community. However, it does have a magnificent public library right now. But in its beginnings, it sort of had a public library in a former Bank of America branch building. Um, but there was a diligent group of people who raised the funds to, to acquire land and build a be beautiful building. And the gentleman who did so is well in his 90s and wants that story captured and told. So I am working with an art artist here in um, probably a two-part article talking about how we got to where we are today. Um, the Rancho Mirage Public Library also now has an observatory attached to it. So I am now a fundraiser for an observatory in addition to a public library. So it's been a learning experience. I'm now a stargazer. And tonight I'm told there's a magnificent meteor shower here in California. <laughs> Barb, how about you? What are you working on these days that you- I'm actually finishing up a master's in museum studies. I have two more classes left, which I can't believe it. Wow. Um, I'm also very involved in the Jewish Historical Society of Michigan. And I'm also on a new nonprofit. I'm very excited about the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation, which is really talking, looking at Albert Kahn's legacy and his innovation design and his global impact. So looking at architecture around Detroit and throughout the world, so. Still, still Detroit and uh, loving to learn. Yeah, I'm still in libraries. I feel very fortunate that in my retirement, I was able to continue in a field that I love and continue to love. Oh, well, this has just been, it's, it's just been a marvelous, marvelous evening. Um, and, and the time has been too short. It's gone so quickly this hour. Thank you, Patrice Merritt and Barbara Cohn for a fascinating look at the art and architecture of Detroit Public Library. It, it has been a terrific way of celebrating the centennial of the main library. Um, the book is the Detroit Public Library, an American classic. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all. Good night, Detroit. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Good night, everybody.